press and go live. Hello, and welcome to this evening's 40 Days of Engagement on Anti-Racism, today's uh, 40 Days live event. My name is Adele Halliday, and I'll be uh, hosting our gathering today. Um, this evening's 40 Days live event is part of a, a much larger program, the 40 Days of Engagement on Anti-Racism. This is the last 40 days event that have been running every Tuesday. Um, part of the program, it's been running from October 12th to November 26th. Um, every day, there are opportunities for learning, uh, children's activities, faith reflections, ideas for advocacy, and group commitments, and more. Um, today, we are focusing on light and dark images in Advent. Uh, today's content was written by myself and my colleague, Olivia Smith, who will introduce ourselves a bit more in a moment. Um, if you want to access today's comment, uh, content, you can go to the uh, webpage for the 40 Days Live event, click on today, day 37, uh, and you'll you'll come to this page. And then if you go to the very bottom under downloads, you'll be able to access the content where you'll find the learnings, children's activities, and more. <clears throat> Throughout the 40 days, there have been uh, weekly books that have been featured, weekly books on anti-racism. This week, there are actually two books. One is called Jesus and the Marginalized, Jesus Christ for Koreans in the United Church of Canada. So yes, this is a United Church book that will soon be available from the United Church Bookstore. Um, currently available is True Inclusion, which is on creating communities of radical embrace. So one is available, one is coming soon. And if you order before November 26th, so just a few more days and use the discount code 40 days, you'll get a discount of 20% for orders of two or more books. So it's ucrgstore.ca, 20% off of two or more books before November 26. So now by way of introduction, uh, today as we explore um, light and dark imageries of Advent, it will be myself and Olivia Smith who are in conversation. Um, myself, I serve as the anti-racism and equity lead staff at the National Office of the United Church. Um, I use she, her pronouns. Uh, I staff one of our national committees, the United Church's Anti-Racism Common Table. And our Common Table together has been working on an anti-racism action plan, which will be rolled out in the new year. And I'm deeply committed to and have been involved in anti-oppression work in, with churches and in Canada for, and beyond um, for many, many years and feel a deep call and passion for this work. Lydia, over to you. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me on the last of the 40 days. It's great to see your faces. Uh, I'm Olivia Smith. I, uh, I work at the General Counsel Office as well, and I'm a network coordinator who oversees worship, music, and spirituality resources and resourcing. My passion is helping people connect with the holy and helping people praise God and to live into God's presence, as we like to say in the United Church. And then I'm supposed to lead you in an opening prayer. <laughs> Let us pray. I thought that we would um, share the prayer that was used today in the 40 days. And then I might also add my hope for this gathering. I hope that we're, that we're able to have a meaningful and rich conversation this evening, and I pray that it will be with us throughout our Advent journey. Let us pray. Bright, shining Christ, I don't want to be washed whiter than snow or become the light that banishes all darkness, the fair, bright, and pure one. Instead, I want to be bathed in the earth's soil, becoming the darkness that births new life, the deep, mysterious, and mystic one. I want to be like you, glorious, growing child of God. May it be so. May it be so for us all. Amen. Amen. And thank you for opening us up, Olivia. Um, so we're going to engage in some conversation. And uh, please feel free to add questions, comments, thoughts in the chat throughout. Um, we'll also add a few links in the chat as we go. Um, but Olivia and I will engage in conversation about light and dark imagery in Advent. So Olivia, uh, how does light and dark imagery affect you when worshiping? 
You know, it really depends on the context. Like there are some situations where light and dark imagery doesn't really bother me at all because I know the people I'm around and I know the context and the history of where they're coming from. I think the first time I acutely noticed or felt an awareness of dark and light imagery was, it wasn't an advent, it was an Easter Eve many years ago. And I was at this service and I was feeling very moved because it was, um, you know, we were in darkness and there were all of these spirituals and songs that I knew that were being played as we went through the Christian story. And then Easter came and all of a sudden the instant the incense came out and then all these Wesleyan hymns came out, white tablecloths, white linens, and the darkness of it really it not only put me off, but I had a bit of a visceral reaction because I was feeling so involved in the service with all of these spirituals, dry bones, and all these songs that I knew so well, and it just felt so cozy. And then it was clear that all of that was a lead up to Easter. So all of that, all of all of um, the cultural references and all of the imagery was actually just being used as a foil or like a that's that's not great but here's here's the resurrection and that's great so it was it was when the white tablecloth was like flung out and the bell started ringing and I can't remember what Wesley hymn it was but it was clearly a Wesley hymn <laughs> was being sung then I was like oh that's what we mean by light and dark imagery like it was just like it was like the tablecloth hit me in the face and then and then from then I've always felt the wonder or the tug about, well, what are we really saying here? Because in that service, we were really saying that white is the best and the light, the white, the purity, like it was all being said in the songs and the words and the symbols, even in the smells, like everything just went, Wah! and that, that was a kind of visceral moment that happened for me. And then from then on, I, I never switched back. <laughs> never switched back. Yeah. So it sounds like darkness was something you that something was that was really terrible that had to be left behind before coming to this literally, literally a new light. Um, yeah, and how exactly. difficult that is in terms, yeah, such a, a juxtaposition, a real dichotomy. Yeah. 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 And yeah. I think people and what struck me about it was talking to some people afterwards who didn't notice it. And who really didn't care. Like they, I talked to them about it and I ex said how I experienced it. And they're like, oh yeah, but it's Easter. Like, obviously we need the white tablecloths and the linens. And obviously we're going to sing like Jesus Christ is risen today and like blah, blah, blah. But I'm like, yes, but there are other Easter hymns from other cultures that can also be sung alongside that. And white isn't the only celebratory color and you whipped it in my face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so embedded that people didn't even even but didn't even recognize it yeah absolutely yes I think for, they couldn't hear it they couldn't engage it I think for me when it's yeah. the, the, the song and the reference continually being washed white as snow um and how that's such you know and anyway I, I also have a very visceral reaction to that I remember being in a, a community where it was sung and people were very reverent and and I was upset <laughs> and uh <laughs> Um, and uh, and I remember talking with some of the leadership about it at the time, and uh, it was something very similar. People didn't understand what I was talking about, and I was, you know, um, being named as as um, too sensitive and so on. And uh, right. anyway, it's a real challenge. And I, <laughs> and I imagine too, like, because I know for me, it also felt, I know it wasn't intentionally exclusionary, but you definitely feel othered. Like when no one understands and no one really cares to understand, and then when everyone else is like crying with joy and you're like <laughs> feeling the exact. Yes. And you're crying in pain. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So thanks, it's Lydia. It's othering. It's very othering. Absolutely. And uh, and one person was commented in the chat that it, it's it, this could all dynamic could also be because we're afraid to, afraid to upset the, the tradition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I think so.
So light and dark imagery, we talked about when worshiping, um, light and dark images are used extensively through Advent um, and throughout mm -hmm. our liturgical year. So I wonder if we can talk a little bit about what scriptures might reference light and darkness and also how do we interpret these scriptures? How might we preach about them? Yeah, there's, um, yeah, yeah. There's a few that kind of pop straight to mind. Like the first one that pops to mind, of course, is Isaiah 9-2 which I guess we're going to hear third week in Advent, like um, the people who have walked in the darkness have seen a great light, deep darkness covered the earth. And I forget the last part of that verse. Or um, John 1, 5, like John's, John's nativity narrative, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. That, that comes up this year as well. And yeah those are two really specific ones that that will come up. I think for me, part of it is the knowledge that Anthony Bailey points out in, um, in today's reflection as well, that these texts have been racialized. And often in biblical interpretations and preaching, the texts have been, we have been conditioned to use or to equate light with coming to the right or the white side like it's always that sort of trajectory and I really think that the scripture passages themselves are more talking about moving from ignorance into knowing and how we take our I know for myself it's I'm I'm steeped in a very Western Christian training and a Western Christian upbringing, which is also very white. So I know that I'm projecting a lot of that into the scripture reading. So part of it for me is pulling back and trying as much as I can to speak the scripture in context, but also to name, to name where my bias is with that and how I might agree or disagree with that. I also think it's helpful when we can complicate it a little bit. Like in, in year C, we also get Baruch 5.9, which we often don't preach on because we usually preach on the Malachi, but the Baruch is, for God will lead Israel with joy in the light of their glory. And oftentimes I know people will like go to these texts instead of like those who have walked in darkness have seen light because it doesn't explicitly say that dark is bad. But it says that light is good only. So it says the same thing, really. <laughs> so I, I think skipping over some doesn't actually help. I prefer preaching on things like um, Malachi and the refiner's fire because it adds danger to the light. So it is saying that light is good, but it's a lot more complex than that, right? Like it's talking about fire and how it can be dangerous as well. So I like to think in preaching how I might be able to move away from binaries. So to move away from good, bad, evil, angelic, light, dark, and, and complexify it a bit. I don't think complexify is a word, but I think- <laughs> That's all good. And, <laughs> and then the, um, the one that you mentioned, Adele, I think is the passage that irks me the most and I'm not gonna lie I often just don't preach on it but it's uh Psalm 51 the wash me and I shall be whiter than snow I'll be cleaner than Aesop blah 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 and it often comes up more in Lent during the lectionary which is often even more ironic because it so sometimes falls like right at the beginning of Black History Month and I think what hurts me the most about this passage is that it reminds me of particular people and situations where I have literally been referred to as dirty or where people have literally said, oh, you can wash it clean. Like, so there's like specific examples that kind of sit with me. So I think there's a personal reason why it's particularly irksome. And then stories I've heard from others as well. So I know that partly because of my own emotional attachment to that text. I just don't preach on it because I don't think I could do so in an unbiased way at the moment. 
but and I, I also wouldn't preach on any text like that because I know that they're harmful and I wouldn't preach I wouldn't read the text if I wasn't going to preach on it like I do think that there's some irresponsibility there to like leave that in the room and let scripture itself like I don't think that works in our current context mm. yeah absolutely so so great so there are times where we might just uh we might need to skip over something that's that's particularly harmful, but and 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 in many contexts we can also use or engage a language that's more expansive. So not a simple binary good bad, um, but just how, how we might use expansive language right. for God, exploring multiple passages in which, mm -hmm. yeah, dark is is used in many different ways as well. And even just naming it, like I think, mm -hmm. like I've preached on many epiphanies arise, shine your light has come, and then I've named like. Here's why this can be problematic. I just haven't figured out how to do that with whiter than snow without like going into a very long <laughs> sermon on shades. <laughs> yes, that could be a story for another day, a sermon on shades. Yeah. <laughs> so that's great. Thank you. Um, so are there other examples where we um we notice evil is black, purity is white. And again, we've, we've talked a little bit about this, but why is the language problematic, particularly when it comes to anti-racism work? Yeah, I think, well, I'd love to hear what you think about this too. So I'm, I'm going to put the question back at you, Atel. <laughs> but I do think uh, for me, it's sort of like the practical application of an idea. Like we use the words, to help cement it. So the idea being that there is a hierarchy of races with white at the top, like the idea is basically racism, right? And shadism becomes one of the ways or language or tools that we put that belief into practice that we kind of test it out with each other. And so it makes sense in certain ways if you understand the racism of, of it all, but it's very um, a part of the culture and the ethos. But I also think it's problematic. So it's problematic because it points to what is, like it points to the reality of our society and how it's made up. But it's also problematic because what we say, and I believe this strongly in worship and in all other places is formative for us, right? Like it helps to form and shape who we are. And it's powerful repeating beliefs. That's how we instill some of them. So it's the same way that within the United Church, we like to repeat in many different ways that God is love. We like to repeat in many different ways the, those words of Julian Norwich, that all shall be well. We like to repeat in many different ways, united in Christ. And we do these things because it's aspirational. It's kind of who we want to become. So we keep on saying it and saying it and saying it in the hopes that it will embed into our practice. And there's no difference in doing that than in repeating dichotomies of like shadism and things like that so that it can also become embedded into the culture and the practice and harder to separate. So we, we hope that you know, that kind of 60, 70 school that they'll know we are Christians by our love, that like love and Christianity go together, but also Christianity and whiteness can go together. And like, those are ones that we don't necessarily want to name as much, but if we don't name it and don't address it, we'll just continue to perpetuate it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. And uh, I think for me, some very specific examples that come up in language are things like um, like black hearted um, or black male, not black male, black male. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, um, like black as sin, those, those are of the many examples, um, but they're all negative and they're, they're so interwoven in language that it, I, I've heard it just come up in casual conversation. And yet when it comes up, it's like a wound. I feel a wound <laughs> because it's it continues to reinforce negative images of one's self and also how we begin to treat one another. 
Um, yeah. I think it also can lend itself, we've talked a little bit about shadism, it can also easily lend itself towards internalized racism. If you're constantly hearing, if the message constantly being repeated is black is bad, black is bad, black is negative, if you are a person who has black skin, <laughs> you cannot help but internalize some of that messaging, no matter how much positive reinforcement or you tell yourself or are given by other people in your community. If this is constantly around you in your worshiping community, in English language that's spoken around you, um, some of it gets absorbed, whether we want to or not. So I think that's a particular 100%. challenge. Yeah, uh, a particular challenge. So how do we challenge the, the racism that's embedded in our language and culture and the way that we describe, uh, way that we have adjectives that describe things and also then in, indirectly describe one another? Yeah, for sure. Because as you say, it makes it harder to challenge and it also makes it so much easier to believe the lie when it's everywhere, right? Because in the movies we watch, the hymns we sing, the images that we stare at when our minds wander in church. Like, you know, when you just look up at the stained glass and then you see like, Jesus. Like, you, I always see that same Jesus. Like, you know, when I'm looking up at the same, but looking at the stained glass. You see blonde and blue eyed? Yeah, the yeah. kind of <laughs> hair and the little sheep in his hand. Yeah, yep. he's very gentle. Yeah. <laughs> and then, and everything around affirms so clearly that white is superior, right? Like white is pure, white is holy, white is fair, white is just. It just makes it so hard not to internalize it. And I'm sure it makes it hard on the other end as well. Like it makes it hard to not always think that you're in the right, right? Because like it's always affirmed in everything around you. So, so yeah. It can be really hard not to internalize it, but I think what um, like what I think part of the job of the church should be, I don't always think that we live up to this, but part of our role as the church is to affirm the holiness and the godliness in each of us, right? So to be so to affirm for people coming into your pews that they are loved and beloved by God. And when we don't be careful with our language, we could be saying one thing, but not living that out in another way. So I'm concerned about how those people feel. How does that little young forming black mind feel when they come into my church? Do they know that they are loved? Do they know that they are accepted for who they are? Do they know that they are beautiful? Am I saying platitudes, but the things around me don't speak the same truth? Because we can read that, right? Like we know we're not safe in a space. Like I knew that on Easter Eve, mm. kids infinitely smarter than I am. Like Absolutely. They, from the moment you say something out of your mouth that doesn't act, that doesn't go with your actions. So Absolutely. So, so we've talked about the racism that's embedded in language, ways that it affects oneself, the concept of internalized racism and the importance of being loved and having that affirmed in, around us. So what then do we do um, when the Bible and our Christian rituals are filled with images of light and darkness that's, that still sometimes reinforce that dichotomy? What might be some yeah. alternatives? Yeah, for sure. Like. I think for trick for scripture, it's a little bit of what uh, like I don't have an answer for that, but what I personally do is I try as much as possible to listen for the spirit. I know that sounds like a cop out. I'm just gonna pray, but no, but there's more to it than that. <laughs> but to listen for the spirit and to take it, I try as much to take the text for what it is. And I realize that my lens and my perspective is deeply steeped in Western Christianity and try as I might, and as much as I'm working on it, it's deeply steeped in what I was trained with, which is a lot of whiteness. So I, I try and take that all with a grain of salt and realize that that's the lens that I'm coming into it with. So it is, um, I, it's hard for me to read that into, it's easy for me to read that into scripture. So sometimes it's hard for me to take it out. So I try to take it out and to see like, what is like, where's the truth and where's the wisdom? But 
it's active work to take out like the lenses, the problematic lenses that I might bring to it. And I think there's a huge piece of humility in there that I am fully aware that I don't really know what's going on in the Bible. I really don't. Like, I went to school, lots of us went to school for it, but I don't really know what's going on. So it's, um, it's being humble about that and realizing that a lot of what I think is going on is my projections into it and my projections that are so rooted in like a Western Christian understanding, which is so rooted in like the doctrine of discovery and it's so rooted in so much um, colonialism and so much imperialism and so much whiteness. So Absolutely. Like, try and separate that. So there's like, there's the scripture part. And then, so I know that's not really an answer, so I'm sorry, but I think what I'm saying is realize that so much of what we know so much of what I've learned is based on something that I'm trying to unlearn. <laughs> so oh, absolutely. But and, and, and humility. Yeah, it, that's a great answer because there's a lot, a lot in there in terms of, of, of self-awareness, of being aware of, of the, the culture and ethos in which we've been raised and trying to separate that. Um, I, one thing I, I, I try to do or try to encourage for myself is um, is is reading um, kind of multiple interpretations that come from mm -hmm. particularly from a variety of racial and cultural contexts. So recognizing, yeah. of course, that we do have, have all these biases that we're coming into with our understanding and our interpretation. Um, if we're reading from multiple perspectives, um, could that broaden it? Um, you know, earlier we talked about how, uh, you know, each of us had individual separate experiences of, of, um, of, uh, of worship where we were both jolted and yet people around us didn't have that experience at all. So the more that we can kind of be engaged with um, um, additional scripture uh, interpretations, then um, that I think is, is another helpful thing. Yeah, I think so. mm -hmm. uh, for sure. And I, I wish I had brought it. Like, is there a way for me to post tomorrow? I just can't remember the name of the commentary. You know, Haran has this comment was part of a commentary of um, women theologians with some of the wisdom scriptures and the Psalms, mm. the diversity of voices within that. Yes, yes. And I can't remember the name of the collection for the life of me. Yes. And hey, Ron, I've written some other some other really good things too. So we'll we'll pull together. I see there's a question in terms of what what are some resources that we might suggest in terms of scripture interpretations. We'll pull that together overnight, and we'll we'll, we'll send that we'll send out a, a potential list of some resources to start. With. Yeah, I did want to say too because you had asked about like a scripture and cultural, and I'm truthfully more concerned with a what to do when it comes to our Christian rituals and culture. Like the beliefs that we choose to perpetuate, I think are really important. And I, I mean, choose intentionally, like we choose through our words, through our rituals. Like, you know, we take that white cloth to show purity over that brown bread. Like we like, we do a lot of these things pretty intentionally. Um, so, and I also, also, I'm really careful about like how we use those problematic scriptures to justify actions or to throw out actions. Like we might not think that we do that now, but like there are many times where we can see how people have used Psalm 91 to justify things like, oh, you know, well, these people were walking in darkness. Like these are things that we just need to name and to explain why they're problematic and say, you need to change your language about that. And, and to start afresh. So I do think how not just um, the scripture that we use when we're together as Christians growing in the faith, but how we share those things outwardly to others. So what we say at baptisms, how we, how we do that, like what we show as signs of celebration, what we show as symbols when we decorate our churches on special occasions. Like I think they also say something as well. Yes, absolutely. So our rituals are essential. Mm -hmm. um, should we talk about hymns? Let's talk oh, about yeah. hymns. 
<laughs> uh, so what what hymns might explore light and darkness in different ways? Let's let's list some. Let's brainstorm some. Um, we've talked about low, how a rose is blooming, maybe an alternative. God in the darkness, more voices, 17, um, and joyful in the dark. Um, these are some, some that offer uh, a more expansive um, view of darkness. Um, are there other ones that you might name or other ones that you might um, challenge or? Yeah, I think, um, well, you know, I could talk about hymns for at least a week straight without breaks. <laughs> Like, I think I could talk about hymns forever, but I think um, when we think about light and dark imagery and hymns, the first thing that pops into my mind and the one that's always been the biggest contention in any like hymn workshop or anything I've been to is Ferris Lord Jesus. Like, I can't get this hymn out of my life and I really want it to get out of my life. Like, it's beautiful. It's such a gorgeous hymn. We all know it's gorgeous. 17th century German and it's so problematic. I can't sing it. Like It's so problematic for me. And I appreciate, I personally appreciate hymns that try to um, broaden the metaphor, but it's kind of hard to list because for centuries, I feel like so many of our hymns in just really subtle third verse, second line ways have put in good, bad, evil, angelic metaphors because that light, dark, good, bad has captured people's imaginations for centuries, right? Like Chronicles of Narnia, Harry Potter, Death Eaters, like light, dark, it just like, it's shorthand. So it's really hard to get rid of shorthand that has been used across cultures for so long. So I do love hymns that embrace darkness. So I love the ones that you had mentioned, Adele. I do worry sometimes, though, that some of these hymns attempt to expand our imagination for light and don't go far enough in actually challenging the metaphor. So we're like, it's almost like a, we all know we can't get rid of this metaphor completely. So let's just expand it. But it doesn't necessarily challenge the root of it. So for instance, you know, in many of those beautiful hymns that explore darkness, even in the prayer that I said when we half an hour ago when we started, right? Like even in that prayer, I was basically saying the dark can be good too, but the light is still great. Like, <laughs> so I was trying not to say that the light is still great. Like I was trying to try to do some alternate juxtaposition there, but it doesn't necessarily come across that way because in our minds, we see it as great. So I, I would love to see in the next reiteration, things that help to expand and help us realize that the light can be really bad and really destructive and really evil as well. And I know that that wouldn't be comfortable and it's not really popular. And that's why it doesn't go over that well because it doesn't feel comfortable for us because it kind of counters the shorthand that we have of light being good, dark being evil. And then if you want to switch things up, you make the store troopers wear white. Like, ooh. But like, we all know that that didn't even work. You had, a, you had stormtroopers wear white and then you had a black stormtrooper and that was a Jedi. And oh God, the world almost ended because that doesn't play with the, <laughs> with the story. Thing. Yeah, it played with people. Yeah. Yes, yes. So that's great. Thanks, Olivia. And just an encouragement, uh, People are welcome to add comments, questions in the chat. Uh, if you have questions, things you're wondering about, feel free to drop them in as we go along. Um, it, oh, sorry, yes, go ahead. ahead. No, nope, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go, sorry. <laughs> I was just going to touch on scripture again briefly before we uh, move on to uh, liturgy. And I was just, um, I've been reflecting on, you know, we, earlier we talked about uh, the ways in which our own biases affect how we read and understand scripture. And um, I'm just pushing a little more for us to, to think about the ways in which that's embedded into um, even the, the biblical writers themselves and the way in which they also interpreted scripture. So I think specifically of Song of Solomon, for example, which in different uh, interpretations, um, there's a particular verse that's, uh, that's um, names that the, the woman is black 
and beautiful. Um, and in other interpretations say that she is black, but beautiful, um, which are two completely different understandings, right? Like one is to say that the two go together, blackness and beauty um, are, are not in contradiction. They can coincide uh, in, a, in a lovely way. <laughs> um, the other says, uh, even though she's black, um, you know, she, she is black, but, you know, like they're two, it's a different connotation. And, and um, I remember reading them side by side and again was jolted um, at how different they were and how just that one simple interchanging of word made me feel. Um, and again, it just, it, I thought, you know, again, if that's if the, the biases that are uh, embedded in the way in which we read and understand scripture are not just us, but the writers themselves. And I say that gently, I'm not, I love and read and, and uh, uh, take very seriously our Bible. And yet, um, how do we understand the way in which bias weaves into it? And I think that's why I'm such a big fan of, of um, helping ha having uh, multiple interpretations so that we come to understandings and, and can kind of pull out some of these biases that get embedded in so many different places and that can cause harm. Yeah, and I do think it's so much different interpretations that we've kind of taken forgotten that their interpretations are seen as gospel. Like, you know, people had been having this problem for generations, like the opinions of Paul versus the teachings of Paul. And, and look how many times, look how long it's taken for people to understand that was Paul's opinion. And that's not the, quite the same thing. Yes, like to, to get to that understanding that, yeah, women can preach from the pulpit. Like there was lots of reverence and respect for the Bible and also lots of understanding of the fallibility of people and how we are products in many ways sometimes of our society. Like I don't wanna make an excuse, I'm not excusing bad behavior because I don't think Jesus excused it either necessarily, but he also had bad behavior and- <laughs> Yeah. So and I Absolutely. And I think maybe sometimes, sometimes maybe we need to name, we need to clearly kind of name some of our biases, um, even as we're leading, um, as we're leading and, and yeah. sure that this, this has affected my reading and understanding. Here's my interpretation. There may be other interpretations as well. Yeah, um, exactly. Exactly. And I do think that's where reading it from other perspectives mm -hmm. is important as well. Like, you know, just, just to hear how, um, just to hear how different communities hear that scripture passage and the stories that have been passed down from those scripture passages. Absolutely. So uh, I wonder if we can talk a little bit about liturgies. And again, you know, people are mm -hmm. welcome to comment, ask questions in the chat. So what about our liturgies? Um, our liturgies also incorporate light and darkness. Um, we light candles to signify God's presence. We're just about to move into Advent and many of our, our communities of faith will have Advent lighting candles uh, weekly as we move towards Christmas uh, and many more. So mm -hmm. um, what do we suggest we do about this? Um, or, yeah. I do think, um, I do think, what was I gonna say? Sorry, I, I got distracted by a comment there and I didn't get a chance to read it fully. <laughs> I, um, what I was trying to say was, I don't necessarily see, I think that there's a lot of beauty in a lot of our Advent rituals that I love. And I don't necessarily see lighting a candle in the darkness as negative imagery, but I do also realize that it's because of the lens that we use, right? And the lens that I'm using going through. And for myself, I see it as a relationship between light and dark and a contrast or juxtaposition, you know, but the wording behind how we present the liturgy matters and thinking about how others might interpret that liturgy matters as well. So I might not see it as um, darkness, bad, light, good. I'm saying light in darkness, like the two of them together in relationship create this beauty. But if I, if I'm not communicating that in some way, that's not helpful to anybody else. So I think like, for instance, I'm thinking of 
Christmas Eve services of past and the magic of the kind of candlelit Christmas Eve cervix. And for me, that magic is the juxtaposition of the stillness, the quiet, the kind of dim, dark atmosphere and the excitement. And for many of us worship leaders, there's also that fear and worry and apprehension about open flames and little children and burning wax and bulletins that could catch on fire. And like in that liturgy, the light is actually the really dangerous element if we think about it. Like that's the thing that's causing me the most stress in that liturgy is that candle. And it's the wild thing, right? Like it's the thing that we can't control and that we can't confine. And we've spent most of our time thinking about and the darkness is that safe and comforting part. It's like the part that allows people to hide their tears and it protects us, it kind of keeps us warm, helps us to feel like we're in community even if we're feeling a little bit alone. So there's something really beautiful in that service that I would never want to let go of, but I would, I would want to test people's assumptions. I wouldn't want someone coming into that liturgy thinking that I'm wanting to get rid of the darkness. That, like I'd want them to think about like the wildness of that fire and we're inviting it in to like the space that is. So that, um, that different way of looking at it or lens, I think, is important to share in some way, but it means that I need to change my lens of looking at it too. Like if I actually thought that that symbol was to mean light in the darkness and the darkness, I mean like the dreary horridness of the world, then I would need to change that. Like then I wouldn't necessarily be in a place to use that as part of my liturgy because it's in a, it's in a place that's potentially causing harm. So how, what am I, trying to do here. So I think it's important for us as worship leaders to not accept negative imagery or to accept imagery that instantly puts us in a dichotomy, like healed, unhealed, well, unwell, like to, to not accept those kind of easy ones and to not, yeah, to not default to easy worship tropes, if I can say that, like we need to try our best to be as clear as possible in what we do so that we are to the best of our ability saying what we mean and meaning what we say like I know that we can't do that all the time like we really try our best to be authentic and none of us can do that fully but we really want to try to do our best and to actually say what I actually mean great so so <laughs> No need to do away with Advent liturgies. No need to do away cool. with candle lighting. And we keep them as part of our worshiping communities and we continue to offer expansive language for how we understand light and dark imagery. Yeah, and I think we kind of, um, we have to, I don't know how to say it properly, but like we gotta realize the context of things and the lens in which we look at things like I think we just need to really be clear about naming clearly exactly what we mean and exactly what we want to say like I was thinking about this when you were thinking when you were talking about the songs and like sometimes it's easier to sing things that we don't fully believe and we do that all the time right like we always sing things that we don't fully believe because we trust the people around us. We trust the people who wrote them. We trust the tradition that it comes from. We trust the legacy of it, right? So, and sometimes we go back and learn the context of the songs and then they become harder to sing, right? Like, so for instance, there are some sing songs that I sing, some heart songs that do have dark and light imagery, like the storm is passing over, Charles Abbott, Tyndall, you know, have courage, my soul, and let us journey on for the night is dark and I am far from home. I'm not gonna stop singing that song. My grandma taught me that song. Like, <laughs> like there's, there's something really important about that song for me and the worship setting that I learned it in. It was, it was surrounded by people who were teaching me that black is beautiful. It's a very different context than a United Church context where that hasn't been my experience where like, you know, we've been, singing hymns and then all of a sudden Easter comes and then white is beautiful. Like that's a different context. So I can still sing that song, Ferris Lord Jesus. 
like for, for, for me, Ferris Lord Jesus, it's a song about British imperialism in so many ways. It's a song rooted in the concept of purity and whiteness, like fair is the sun shine, fair the still the moonlight, all the twinkling starry hosts. Even though we're talking about nighttime, Jesus shines brighter and Jesus is purer than all the angels in heaven can boast. And I realized that it's a beautiful hymn, but I learned it in a context that was trying to teach me that white was good. I learned it in a context looking at a white Jesus holding a white sheep. Like that's a, that's a juxtaposition that I can't reconcile. And I also have been in situations where I have seen the harm that it has caused to other people. So I've seen people walk out of the church and then a community of faith continue to sing it. Like, so that's a completely different situation than like the storm is passing over where there is dark and light imagery there, but contextually and from the community and in the, in the spirit of which it's singing means something totally different than fairer still the mountains. I don't know if that further <laughs> confused. Yeah, uh, no, this, this is, it's all great. It's an ongoing conversation. And there has been some conversation in the chat as well. So, um, so first a, a, a comment and wondering about um, how do communities of faith make changes when there might not be people of color in the communities themselves? Um, and a response to say that all communities, regardless of whether there are people of color, need to do this work. Uh, white people For are sure. also affected by images of white as good and black as bad. And this conversation and some of the books suggested might be a helpful guide. Mm -hmm. I think it's even more important when there's not diversity within your, with, with, when there's not visual racial diversity within your community of faith, because it further cements the ideas without anyone to challenge it. Absolutely. Absolutely. So important work for us all to be engaged in. Um, and there's also some comments around uh, intentional expansion on these themes. So darkness and life-giving place of the womb or dark rich soil uh, and blinding white light and overexposure of images. And mm -hmm. noted in, in art as well, some of the best images are balance and juxtaposition of, of both. Dark can make lights pop. And if you don't, you cannot see the stars if it's not dark. Right. And I do think, um, for instance, in most of the resources that we put out, depending on the cultural context of it, like we do do many blanket edits to help people get to the root of what they're meaning. So like things like dark day, bright night, or I said that in the opposite direction, didn't I? Bright day, dark night, <laughs> that, that we might change that to, to, to be more clear about like you're talking about the sunlight, like. Yeah, that, absolutely. It's another and, example of the shorthand that we were talking about. Yeah, before. exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. To remove the shorthand. And then to also, the also concern that can come, that can creep in, particularly when we're talking about dark and light imagery, is that ableism often creeps in as well with kind of seeing and unseeing and, and visibility. And, and we often equate darkness with blindness and assuming that blindness is bad and there's a whole bunch of problems with that as well so there are many things that we talk about where getting more specific helps us in not using tropes and not othering more people or making assumptions based on a purity culture that we don't quite live in anymore well, that we hope not to live in. I don't Indeed. mean culture. I mean um, a sort of ableist yeah. culture. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Great. Good. Uh, a couple other things that have come up in the chat that sometimes the, the beautiful old hymns might have new life with new lyrics. Absolutely. So maybe an encouragement. You can for... remember to sing it. Yes, if you can <laughs> I remember. Yes. <laughs> Indeed. So maybe an encouragement among us might be to think about what are some new lyrics that we might want to infuse in, in hymns. Maybe some among us might have gifts for hymn writing and who knows, can create some new hymns with new lyrics. That would be wonderful. Um, mm -hmm. Noting that explicit examples, as noted before, the um, kind of the, the um, 
overexposure of light, for example, can um, be helpful to make changes. Um, yeah, great. And then some playing with words here. Silent night, all is bright. Great. Good. Olivia. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so back over to you. Um, so we've been talking about signs, we've been talking about symbols, uh, Christian rituals, uh, what signs and symbols are important to you? You know, it's interesting. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question because there are lots of signs and symbols that are important for me, but they've been changing. And during this kind of pandemic time, they've moved away from like actual symbols, like crosses and fish and trees and new life and things like this to like people. And we just had a Advent Unwrapped event this morning, this afternoon, where Diane Strickland was talking about John the Baptist. And I was like, oh, I could hold on to John the Baptist as an image, like this kind of rough around the edges, not fitting in sort of guy who, who, um, who spoke his truth. Like, and was accepted in some ways and not in others, but like that kind of the path of John the Baptist and that kind of clearing a path. And then last advent or epiphany, really, the epiphany that came to me was the messiness of new life and the child Jesus. Like I've always thought of, and I know it's partly because I have a toddler and he's like banging on the door. So it's easy to think of like the child and the messiness because I'm living in the messiness and the chaos of it. But the um, this there's something also really powerful of thinking of our deity as a child and the community that it takes to love and to grow and to support and to nurture that person into who they're going to become is amazing. And I love that relational aspect of it. And it feels very fitting to my understanding of my faith, which is also very relational based. So those sort of symbols of relationships are starting to move with me more because they're a bit more fluid and a bit more complex than kind of like the symbols of, um, you know, the, the lamp or the light in the darkness. Like for me, the 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 ones that show a relationship have been really important for me in these upcoming years and it's been helpful for me in a reminder of the complexity of it all so that I don't it's helping me to not fall into like the binary sort of thinking which I'm trying to expand myself to great expanding beyond the binary excellent yeah and there's a comment in the chat that picks up on a bit of that as well. Um, so the comment is there's a need to decolonize the idea of demonizing black and holonizing white. Holonizing. Um, yeah, it's a great word, <laughs> holonizing of white. <laughs> uh, not only starting from the scripture passages, but also starting to starting from referring to some people as quote black and others as quote white. Uh, colonialists refer to others as black, not only in color, but as evil people, and they referred to themselves as, quote, white, not only in color, but in pure, sinless, immaculate, and holiness. Um, and the person comments, I think that reclaiming blackness is just like reclaiming Negroism because it's the same word in a different language. Kind of different connotations. Like, I think self-identity is important. And the fact of the matter is, is that as long as racism exists, we'll need to name, we'll need to name people so that we can name the issue that's happening. Like, absolutely. And I think what I'm hearing here, though, is the importance of reclaiming. So how do we, mm -hmm. at one point, we were, we were named, and now there's a reclaiming, um, and, and then us putting a positive spin on who we are and who we want to be named as. So yeah, it's yeah, kind yeah. of uh, makes the, sense. Sorry. Um, yeah. No, no, it's all good of, uh, of um, decoupling, I guess, the, the word black from evil, but reclaiming evil in, in its fullest sense um, and what that might mean and look like. Mm -hmm. yeah. Are there other comments, questions that people might have? 
we're coming close to the end of our time and we're exploring light and dark imageries of Advent. We've talked about a lot today in terms of uh, expansive, um, using more expansive imagery, embracing um, multiple interpretations as we're looking at scripture of, of the challenges of racism that's embedded in language um, and culture, the way in which it links to internalized racism and uh, has a negative effect on many among us. Moving beyond the binary, uh, there's been lots covered today. Having a piece of humble pie. <laughs> piece of humble pie. Uh, naming our biases, even as we're leading and this continuing challenge around self-awareness and what do we do with that. Um, not always avoiding uh, rituals and not necessarily even avoiding passages, but um, leading, preaching, and again, doing it in a more expansive way. Mm -hmm. And naming. Like not avoiding passages, but naming the potential harm that they can cause or have caused. So there's a question as well about um, books that could be offered. Um, there, uh, I, I mentioned one book at the very beginning, but there have been several books kind of featured throughout the 40 days. So um, almost, almost all of them are available from the United Church Bookstore. Um, so I've just put that list in the chat. Um, one book is sold out. The first one about preaching about racism. Lots of people wanted to do that one. So that one sold, temporary sold out. Uh, but many of the others are available. Um, the last, so the books are Preaching About Racism, A Guide for Faith Leaders. That is the other side of the pew, um, from Church Pew to Sweat Lodge. Uh, another, but I don't see as Asian curation, um, as Asian curation conversations about race. Um, another Healing Haunted History is a settler discipleship of decolonization. The other is Breaking the Ocean, a memoir of race, rebellion, and reconciliation. Another, this is the United Church one, um, or uh, many contributors were United Church in this book, um, Reflections on Emancipation and Anti-Black Racism for Canada. And the last one that I mentioned at the beginning, Jesus and the Marginalized Jesus Christ for Koreans in the United Church of Canada. So those are some books that might um, be among ones to start us off. Um, oh yes, yeah, sorry, and true inclusion as well. Thank you. Yes, I mentioned that at the beginning as well. So there's some books that could get us started off um, or continue the conversation. Uh, and as noted, we'll, we're, we will also continue to share um, uh, resources for uh, interpreting from multiple lenses as well. Are there other questions and comments before we move to a close? Well, today is the last 40 days live event for um, the 40 days of engagement on anti-racism. And yet uh, the hope is that this is not an end, but is a continuing, continues a way to continue the conversation. Um, we, this conversation points towards Advent. So there's lots of ways in which this can be woven into the next liturgical season and beyond. Um, and of course, conversations and in engagement and action on anti-racism can be ongoing. Um, much of the content around the 40 days of engagement will stay on the website for a while. So even though the, the daily content is officially coming to an end on the 26th, uh, the, um, the daily content will also stay uh, alive <laughs> um, and could be used at other points in the year as well. And of course, the uh, videos are recorded and they will also be available in case you wanted to view them again or access them again or show them in a broader, a broader context. So with that, I'll offer our thanks to all of you for being part of this conversation and being and engaging. Uh, thanks to Olivia, my colleague companion <laughs> in this conversation today around light and dark imagery and Advent. Uh, thank you to Brian Mitchell Walker for doing tech behind the scenes. And again, thank you to all of you for um, your time. Over to you, Olivia. anything else you want to add? Oh, no, thank you. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you all and um, blessings on your day. Oh, blessings on your Advent. Blessed Advent. <laughs>